my dad landed on Normandy Beach on July 4th, 1944. And on that 4th of July, he was able to drive his Jeep off that landing craft onto the beach and all the way into France to rejoin the front lines as a junior officer in the 3rd Armored Division. Now, the problem that immediately became apparent to my dad was that he didn't have to drive far. In 28 days since D-Day, instead of penetrating deeply in France like they'd planned, our Allied forces were still held to within 20 miles of those beaches. Now, the problem had actually started hundreds of years ago when the Normans planted trees to separate their fields because they didn't have enough stone to make walls. And over the years, those trees, the roots of those trees, grew into massive walls of earth, eight feet high and 12 feet wide at the base, called hedgerows. And our tanks could not drive through these walls. We could only go around them on the small number of roads. And the Germans had anticipated this, and they had prepared an extremely effective defensive strategy. They would knock out all of our lead tanks, creating roadblocks. And when we tried to move laterally down the walls to blow up in an open section with dynamite, the explosion alerted the Germans exactly where to redirect their fire. They would simply focus on the open gap, wait for the next tank to drive through, knock it out, and effectively reseal the breach in the wall. Our forces were losing more tanks in the first several hours, the first several days of engagement like this, than they planned to lose in the first several weeks. The entire invasion and the future of the world as we know it today was in jeopardy of being shut down and altered. Now here's where the first remarkable thing happened. An all-hands-on-deck meeting was called between the commanding officers at the top, including Patton himself, all the way to junior combat soldiers for suggestions. All pride and idea ownership was gone. A new way had to be found. Now consider, here was the US military, the most sophisticated, hierarchically structured, systematic organizational structure you could imagine, temporarily suspending its normal process to allow those in the heat of combat to come forward with their own ideas. Now, the reason was simple, because to the officers at the top who understood all the complexities, there was imminent chaos. There was essentially nothing to work with. So fortunately, they invited others into the discussion that didn't understand the complexities. But what these others did have was their own unique perspectives. And it so happens that a young combat soldier named Cullen came forward with the idea to put a giant fork on the front of one of our tanks. Now, Cullen was laughed at at first, but the backstory that my dad had heard was that Cullen may have grown up on a farm and had seen something similar as a boy, because for years, farmers had placed giant spears on the fronts of their John Deere tractors to be able to impale giant bales of hay to lift them up and move them. So, they built a prototype and then they secured an open area field that was protected where they could test it. And the commanding officers were amazed when they saw how this tank could now ram these giant walls of trees with the forks penetrating deeply, cutting the root system in half, releasing huge sections of earth as the tank appeared to burst through without hardly slowing down. Now my dad was part of a small team that was given the assignment to fabricate the first 50 of these head shoppers, as they were now called, as fast as humanly possible. So the next challenge they faced was where could they possibly find the raw materials to fabricate these giant forks? This was an invasion task force. There was not a minute to waste. There wasn't time to order materials from England. The Germans, as you can imagine, were reconverging everything that they had to prepare a massive counterattack to stop us. Well, you might recall those images of the landing beaches, where the Germans had placed hundreds of giant metal crosses in the surf, intended 
to prevent our landing craft from making shore. Well, my dad worked with crews and went back down to those beaches with cutting torches. And those same crosses, those spikes intended to stop our ships from landing, became the perfect raw materials to fabricate the forks that enabled us to break through. Now consider the irony of that for a moment. So, as soon as enough hedge choppers were built, they were assembled to the fronts of our tanks. Those tanks were then distributed across the entire Normandy countryside. And our forces were then able to burst through these walls at so many simultaneous points that the invasion again became unstoppable. Now, this was one of many stories that my father shared with me, but it was by far his favorite because it's the classic example of American ingenuity, of using hard work, perseverance, and incredible resourcefulness to use what you had to figure out a solution that no one else knew how to solve. Now, as a young boy growing up, aspiring to be a designer like their dad, the story had a huge impact on me. How could it not? The future of the world was at stake. There wasn't a solution in sight. And when the solution came, it didn't come from the most likely source, from the source with the most knowledge. It came from a young mind and from a small team open to possibilities. Now, as I reflected on this story, something else also became very apparent to me, is that the people that solved the problem had a fundamentally different perspective. They didn't frame the challenge with what do I need it was instead, what do I have to work with? So as I began to shape the trajectory of my own career, I saw how many others were following a certain path, working with large, sophisticated organizations, large companies, with lots of knowledge, lots of resources, and lots of structure. But I saw how they were focused often on incremental and slower progress. And I realized that if I wanted to focus on innovation, I had to find a different direction. And this story provided the foundation. So I began studying everything I could possibly find throughout history, from science and technology, stories of innovation and breakthroughs. And I saw a very consistent pattern to the same principles of the story. So that the examples that immediately come to mind, like Apollo 13, when NASA, a large organization, temporarily suspended normal process, and assemble very small teams, and had those teams hyper-focused only on what the astronauts had to work with to bring them home safely. I saw this same pattern consistently repeated in the small teams that were initially Edison, the Wright brothers, Kelly Johnson when he broke from Lockheed to create the Skunk Works, all the way to more recent examples like Google, where in each of these cases, it was the small team initially that somehow had the ability to fully leverage the resources that they had to work with to create extraordinary breakthroughs, often in the face of much larger, more sophisticated competition. Now, over the years, I've been fortunate to learn from these examples and to develop and refine my own process to create a range of projects that apply these same basic principles of reframing the challenge understanding what you have, and then fully leveraging the resources around you to create a solution. So a friend of mine, he's a pediatric neurosurgeon, several years ago became fascinated with understanding more about concussions in football. And he did what anyone would do in beginning a project like this, and he studied all the conventional bodies of information, the science, the medical journals, and then he did something unusual. On a parallel path, he started asking a series of questions to enable our design team to reframe the challenge in a way that we could understand it. He began asking questions like, why are there certain animals, like woodpeckers, that have the ability to take massive impacts to their heads without suffering any apparent damage? And this reframing question allowed our design team to focus on the exact physiology of these animals their brain suspension systems, so that we could model our own mechanical system after what we could find in nature. 
My friend continued to ask a series of questions so that we fully understood the range of forces on the football field. Like when a wide receiver is hit from the side like this and he spins rapidly. Well, this is a different type of force than blunt impact. This is rotational acceleration. And by reframing the challenge in this way, our design team again could focus on something that we understood, which is a rotational bearing. So imagine a wheel brought up on an axis like this, and the wheel becomes the shell of your helmet. And the shell can take impact, and it can dissipate energy while leaving the brain protected and stable at the center. We took these innovations, and it, it has evolved into a whole new generation of football helmet design that are just now becoming available in the market that have the potential to provide a much higher level of protection. Now, the final example I'll give is a wheelchair. And I use this because it's an example that we can all relate to, either through friends and family, or if we're blessed to live long enough, we'll use a product like this ourselves. And this project started with a single question. It was a question that was asked to me by the head of one of the largest health systems in the country. And he asked, why are we moving our patients around in this giant hospital in a 75-year-old piece of technology that was never intended to provide assistance or protection to the people that actually use the product? Why is that? And you can see where this is leading. It was the classic reframing question. It allowed our design team to ask questions like, well, how could you provide assistance in a wheelchair? What, is a, what does a wheelchair user need? Well, it's a chair with wheels on it. It's very difficult to get in and out of, so it would be great to provide a way to get into the chair and then assist you to stand. Well, that's exactly what we did. We created the first integrated standing assist lift by using something else that we immediately could recognize and understand. By breaking it into small parts with backgrounds in automotive design, we recognized that car seats have electric motors. So we simply applied the electric motor from a car seat that everyone in this room can recognize to the challenge of a wheelchair. We attempted to take this idea even further, this concept of reframing. And with this project, we went after, going, we went after changing the, the very concept of what a wheelchair could be from initially the last place that anyone would ever want to sit to the possibility of a wheelchair becoming the most comfortable chair in the house. <laughs> now, whenever I'm tempted to use the excuse that I don't have enough of what I need to solve a challenge in front of me, I think back to the story of these young American soldiers bending constraints to use what they had to work with. So if you're interested in true innovation, let me help you drill into three specific steps. The next time you face a challenge, break it into small parts. By breaking it into parts, you can focus on the elements that you best understand. By centering on what you know, you can much more readily identify the resources around you that you may have to work with to form a solution. And if you can form a solution, and that solution starts to work, you may find that when you reface, when you reface your constraints, that you once thought were insurmountable, you may find that you can bend them. Now, I have no idea what challenges you may be facing today, but I am certain of this. True innovation from bending constraints has been proven to win wars and shape history. Thank you.